Welcome to The Next Journey, the adventure travel podcast with me, Andrew St. Pierre White. I'm a prisoner of this hill. During my career as a motoring journalist, I've had to deal with motoring manufacturers. And most of my dealing, or in fact of all of it really, has been with motoring manufacturers in South Africa. And the first 38 years of my career, in fact my career doesn't even span that long, was in South Africa. And probably the most notable relationship I had, I had a very, very solid relationship with Toyota, notable. But the other most notable relationship was with Land Rover. And it's a story worth telling. In about 1996, 95, re researching a trails book, they loaned me Land Rover, went to them, asked for some defenders and they loaned me two defenders which was quite generous for for them at the time two defenders for two weeks to do a trip through the Richtersfeld. i had my own defender and the two defenders would actually be driven by friends of mine so this is a little unusual and i'd had one book out at the time so i wasn't really well known i was seeing a few magazine articles and so they were quite generous and they gave me the defenders the one of them had um broken shock absorbers the back shock absorbers were pouring oil so we replaced the shock absorbers at our cost and the other one the air conditioning was falling out but that is quite typical actually of um, press vehicles in those days the press vehicles were badly were badly looked after generally things are much 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 better now and have been much much better for many many years and in fact the, the manufacturers you know when they hand out vehicles to press they make sure that they're in really good condition and they all do it so that was an exception Later on, um, after getting a few vehicles from Land Rover, Discovery got a good, I remember Gold Discovery, we did some off-roading, also researching Trails book, and they were good to me. We had a good relationship. And I think we had a good relationship because I was very pro Land Rover. I was driving my own Land Rover, and my first book was unashamedly pro Land Rover. And then they brought out <clears throat> the Discovery too. Now at this time I was kind of finding my feet in terms of a journalist that was, I had decided that I wasn't going to follow the trend uh, and, and just be, just cut out to advertisers. I wanted to say what I wanted to say. Uh, my opinion meant something to me because <laughs> I'm generally quite opinionated. And I wanted to write what I thought. I wanted to write my impressions, not impressions governed by any other editors or advertisers but I could do that because I had my own publication so I had that freedom and I didn't rely on advertising I later did <clears throat> rely on advertising but at that time I didn't and I wrote an article about the Land Rover Discovery 2 they started a, a, a campaign called Tread Lightly uh, e eco-friendly four-wheel driving practices da 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 absolutely fine good and uh, my comment was how are you going to tread lightly in a vehicle that requires you to wheel spin before it'll actually lock up its transmission because the very nature of the traction control in Discovery 2 was that it it has to spin for the traction control to engage and lock the wheel and transfer power and that was this was a rudimentary one of the early traction control systems and i wrote that land rover are one of the pioneers at this so they're going to probably make more mistakes than others because they're the first and i acknowledge that and still acknowledge it today but they but they <laughs> the review was not good they actually then and it got printed in the magazine as well they called me and said um we would like you to take some proper driver training in the new traction control because what you wrote is r rubbish not complete nonsense so i said okay i'm quite happy to do that if i have if i have missed the boat i will write about it and i was very open with them i will write about it if i have missed the point and just uh, driving it badly and wrongly i'll say so and i'll not necessarily retract but I will reverse and but it's up to me they sent me on a place to a place uh, near Nelspreit in South Africa and another one down in Natal uh, these were the Land Rover the early Land Rover experience um, facilities two very very skilled drivers and instructors took me out 
on one of them they had actually a whole lot of press other press there too they were doing a kind of a second thing about discover, uh, discovery too and i remember so clearly on one of them there was a track that they had built it was very windy and then there was a nice axle twister and then a climb with a twister that's what you do to show off traction control you lift a wheel or two and get it to and they drove all automatic discoveries they were all automatic transmission discoveries the automatic transmission discovery has a central lock-up system called a viscous coupling and it kind of automatically locks the front and rear the, the, the early Range Rovers and Defenders and the Discovery 2 manual have an open center transmission. It's actually a differential, but it's in the middle of the transmission. And it's open, like it is on an axle without a locker. It's open, and you can lock it. Now, what the locking does, it engages four-wheel drive. Without it locked, you have drive to the front, drive to the back, but it's separated by a differential, which means that if a front wheel spins, all of the power goes to the front and no power goes to the back, just like it would on a left and right wheel. There's no difference. So you need to lock that center piece. You have to lock that center piece, otherwise you do, you, while it says permanent four-wheel drive, it's not four-wheel drive. You can lift one of those four wheels and the vehicle will stop. That's not four-wheel drive. Okay. So I had to try and explain to people this is the case. And Defenders and Discovery One and Range, older, older Range Rovers and things had the lockable center differential. So you could, as a driver, could control it. On the tarmac, it's open. On the rough stuff, it's closed. Locked. Four-wheel drive. No locking mechanism on the Discovery Two or uh, manual. None. You had to rely 100% on the traction control. So what would happen is, it, as you would drive, the wheel would spin the traction control would lock up and start locking the spinning wheel. First it would lock the spinning wheel on the opposite an axle and then it would still have no drive at all to the back axle. None! The Discovery 2 without a center differential lock is a two-wheel drive vehicle with traction control on either front or back axle depending on which one's spinning. It was it is hopeless off-road. It is one of the worst. It's, it is, I'm not going to go any further. And this vehicle, we were trying to get it up some slopes. I drove up in a couple of other vehicles. I remember there was a little, there was a little 280 Isuzu. Up there. We went through the river. There were about four vehicles in the convoy. I couldn't get the, the, the discovery through the river. It wouldn't go through the river, over the rocks. It wouldn't. It just wouldn't. It kept on going, front wheel, front wheel, back wheel. Never a front and back at the same time. Hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. So I wrote about it. Now, at this testing center, we drove around in automatics, which have the center locker. Locking, doing that locking work, that vital locking work. And it was very impressive. Very impressive. Of course it was impressive because they built it for the Land Rovers. I see it today. A manufacturer will build a course at a trade expo. It's for their vehicles. It's designed for their vehicles. Their, of course their vehicles aren't going to battle over it. It's not a fair test. And it wasn't a fair test then. But it looked impressive to the press. Most of them are not four-wheel drive experts. They know a bit about it, but they're not experts. And of course all the show vehicles were autos. I said his name was Rob. I said, Rob, can I have a manual, please? He said, we don't have any manuals here. I said, why not? He smiled at me and walked off in the same thing. He knew. He wasn't stupid. We did the course all the way around. I drove it. He was next to me and he said, what do you think? And I said, it's great. It's impressive. Traction control works very, very well. No question about it. Autobox. Where's the manual? At the end, I said, can you do me a favor? I just need to prove something for myself. I'd like to drive that vehicle over there around the same course. And it was a Discovery 1 manual. And he said, yes, I will learn it to you, but, uh, but, you're gonna, uh, but I'm going to get all of the press. Do you mind? I just want all of the press out of here. I said, I don't mind at all. I'm not trying to prove anything to them. I want to prove something to myself. I want to know if I'm being an idiot or whether I'm actually... I've got a point here. He agreed. 
they all moved off and I climbed in that Discovery and I drove it in the style, different driving style, that is required of a, of a, of a um, non-traction control vehicle. Let's now compare the traditional with the new. With traction control, ease the accelerator when traction is lost and... With a conventional system, apply the accelerator when traction is needed and... Now traction control with the correct technique. And conventional four-wheel drive with the correct technique. Two totally contrary driving techniques for two different vehicles. So that when you lift a wheel and it starts to spin, you ease off and as the wheel comes back down, you apply a bit more power and you just, as the wheel spins, you just ease off a bit. Ease off and feel it on. Feel it. And you're doing this all the time with the accelerator. You're keeping traction with the accelerator, it's a dance. With traction control, you keep that accelerator, most of them, absolutely still. So then the power's on, the wheel comes up, it starts to spin, it engages the traction control, the traction control works and the vehicle moves forward. If you take your foot off, traction control switches off and the vehicle stops. So the point I wanted to make to him was, this is no better than the standard Discovery with a lockable centre transmission. It's no better at all. You're fooling yourself. Everybody's fooling themselves. This is new technology for the sake of new technology. It's not actually doing anything. And I drove that Discovery around the entire course. I had no wheel. With the one with traction control, there was quite a bit of wheel spin as you... <laughs> And it goes, and you can hear the wheel spinning, traction control's busy working, going, making the noise. And it's going through the obstacles, and it was going through. And I promise you, I drove that Discovery 1 with no wheel spin. None. Up thing, as it started to spin, he's off, he's off. Just, most of it in low second and low third. Whole course. I said, I'm sorry, Tim, you haven't convinced me. It's no better than the old one. And the old one's really good. So you've got a somewhere to go. Look at the axle articulation on this thing. Discovery One, I owned one for six, seven months. Um, it was, was not my favorite vehicle. However, I do consider it one of the very best vehicles for newbies to four-wheel driving. It's great off-road. It's quite simple. Spares are generally cheap. Uh, yeah, they give a lot of trouble because, well, they're Land Rover products, but that's okay because you learn about the vehicle and you, and it becomes part of what you do. So I think in that respect, the Discovery 1 is a lovely vehicle, actually, in so many ways. The Discovery 2, much less so. And so that then was the end of my relationship with Land Rover until 11 years later. In, it was about 11 years later, and it would have been in 2012, they had a new, up to that point, from the, the, the time that I had slated Discovery 2, they had blacklisted me. No phone calls, not answering emails, not complete and utter blacklist. Don't deal with Andrews and Pierre White. Forget it. Okay. And it was okay with me because I had stood my ground. I, this is what I thought. This was my opinion, and it was only my opinion, but it was my opinion, and I was going to stick to it. I thought that vehicle, the Discovery 2, was very poor off-road. They did, of course, eventually put the differential lock back in, the manual locking back in the center transmission of the Discovery 2, and they actually called it Discovery 2 Series 2. And uh, back came its off-road ability. In fact, it was now even enhanced because it had all of the, uh, the off-road ability of the Discovery 1 and it had this traction control system, which sometimes really worked okay. <laughs> it never worked particularly well. When you compare it with the modern systems, it's rubbish. But it did kind of work at times. So it did. It was better than nothing, I guess. About 11 years later, the Discovery 3 was, uh, Discovery 4 was launched. And when Discovery 4 was launched at that time at Land Rover South Africa, there was a guy called Roland. 
and he was the uh, new marketing director and I had st starting early in the year and I was starting my new TV series and he contacted me out of the blue gave me a phone call Andrew what are you doing this year are you doing another TV series this year yes he said I'd like to give you a car to drive would you like to come and talk to me jumped at the chance I missed the relationship with them you know that was it was the thing if you it was very common in South Africa. I, I once panned the, the Ford V6 Auto pickup. And that would have been about 2006, <laughs> five around there. It was a truly terrible truck. Really, a, it was one of the worst trucks I'd ever driven. And I, I wrote about it. I said, you don't even think about the petrol. It is just, anyway blacklisted boom never spoke to Ford again have since never spoken to Ford again they don't they won't tolerate it in the South African media newspapers can get away with it because they don't rely on advertising they just get a vehicle do a review and write what they like so I would n always take a magazine review with a pinch of salt I still do to this day but now here comes Roland and he says to me and I meet him up in Johannesburg and there's the group of people Two of them at least were there during the Discovery 2 debacle. They were in the boardroom, same people, and they were scowling at me. Hello, morning, morning, morning. You know who you are. Morning, morning. How, how are you, everybody? Right. Morning, morning. Yeah. False smiles. Hello, Andrew. How are you? Nice to see you again. No, it's not. I thought, okay, well, this is going to be interesting. I had nothing to lose. It was out of the blue. So Roland says, okay, you're doing a TV series. Yeah. What have you got in mind? And I said, oh, I'm going to be doing something in uh, Zimbabwe. And we're going to be doing this. And we've got uh, a few plans of that. And he said, what would you do if I gave you a Discovery 4 for a year? And I had to think quick. But I did have something up my sleeve. And what you see in front of me here is a Land Rover Discovery 4. And what I have inside me here is a whole ball of tension because what I'm going to do today is I'm going to drive South Africa's most difficult public road and I'm going to do it in a stock standard luxury 4x4 and I said I would drive it up Baboons Pass in Lesotho to prove that an SUV it's act, they are a, a, amazing off-road, actually. While they are so nice to drive in town, so practical, they are amazing off-road vehicles when you apply the right, you know, environment, skills, all this kind of thing. I said, I want to prove that a stock SUV can cover Baboon's Pass. There is no option not to complete the trail. Once on it, there is nowhere to turn around. So, no turning back. Come up to the top and stop there. Baboon's Pass is well known. It is one of the, if not the roughest public road, probably in all of Southern Africa. There's another one in Lesotho, I can't remember its name now. It's also extremely rough, but it's rough, rough, rough. And the only vehicles that traverse it regularly um, our, lot, our 10 ton Mercedes four wheel drive trucks that take provisions to the remote villages. Very few standard motor vehicles of any kind travel the road regularly. Occasionally they do, but mostly those that do are four wheel drive enthusiasts. And they are driving Land Rovers and Land Cruisers, mostly, with 33 inch wheels and lifts, and you know, they're well equipped. Uh, the Jeep Club went out there with some Jeeps, and uh, that's the kind of people that were enjoying that pass. And we were going to do it in a stock Land Rover Discovery 4. Now, this was a bit of a gamble for me, and he knew it, Roland knew it. And he said, uh, all right, what are you going to do if, uh, if you fail? I said, I don't know. He said, I'll tell you what are we going to do if you fail. We're going to send our guys out to prove that it can be done. I then quickly came in and said, can I film that as well? He said, yes, you can. 
He was a happy man. The board, the people around there were kind of saying... Because <laughs> if, if it breaks it, if it doesn't work, Andrew will print it. That's what the language they were saying. And they were right, I would have. Roland was the only guy in that entire Land Rover marketing boardroom that had faith in the product. The only person that had faith in that SUV. I had more faith than they did. So I thought, oh boy, score a victory there. I really scored a big one there. Holy. Whoops, here we go. Okay. Phase one complete. Phase one complete. <laughs> and he gave me a discovery for, for a year. I did say to him, look, the Burns Pass is probably going to damage the vehicle. And there is a chance that when I return it to you, it's not going to be in great shape. I am not going to do, I'm going to be careful. I'm going to look after the truck. I always do look after loan vehicles. But Baboon's Pass is really, really tough. It's quite bad, that is. And he said, that's fine, I understand that. It's worth it. We're going to do it. Would you do me a favor and go and have some training on the vehicle at uh, the Western Cape Land Rover Experience? And I said, of course, absolutely. So those of you who have watched the videos on YouTube, it's in three parts, if I remember correctly. Link above. Um, watch it. It's w still one of the most memorable trips I've done where uh, the whole trip really was technical off-roading. And Lesotho is wonderful. And I had to make certain decisions with tires. I did change the tires. I put a much stronger tire on it because the standard tires would not have coped. And I said to them, I have to change the tires. They gave me a limited lift list. I could not put the tires I really wanted to. But the tires I did put on worked, did the work, and we didn't have any major tire, any, any tire problems at all. So we were able to come. I didn't want it to be a a tire test, I wanted it to be a Discovery 4 test. And I wanted to make sure that I could, uh, you know, I'd have every chance of, of success in that department. And we did. Watch the videos and you'll see an interesting outcome. But the interesting thing was that when I went to the Land Rover experience, they taught me absolutely nothing that I didn't know about that vehicle already. <laughs> See, now your right front wheel will be in the air as you cross over, and then the right, left rear wheel will also right. lift. But what I did learn, the guys that supported me on the trip, Land Rover, it was a chap who was from, actually from a dealership, uh, another chap that has that's a, a workshop, with uh, does uh, Land Rover servicing, and he knows Land Rovers better than any man alive. I, well, <laughs> probably not, but he's one of those guys. These people that were with me, two vehicles, but two Defender 110s, 33-inch wheels, lifts the whole bank chute. Just watching this Defender and I'm thinking, what on earth did I get myself into? Uh, axle lockers, the works. I had a stock LR4 stock. What I learnt about the LR4, the LR experience, didn't teach me. It was those guys who knew the Land Rovers, I'm sorry, they knew them better than the guys at the experience. Because they taught me some tricks. And without those clever tricks, there is no ways that LR4, LR4 would have got across that. No ways. And it was a trick with a suspension that how you get it into high and how you get it into extended and how you get it into extended when you want to not when the car wants you to and that is why we made that trip with nobody pushing pushing or pulling the LR4 even one inch it drove the entire way I hope you've enjoyed my little story there are lots of wonderful stories uh, ahead You'll find them on the Next Journey podcast broadcast here, where you found this one, and where all good podcasts are broadcast. Weekly, on Sundays, 
the next journey. See you next time. <laughs>